But I find sometimes within the editing process, you kind of you get into this kind of routine of doing the same thing with each, and that that's that can be um, a mistake. You should you should look you should really think about what what you want the viewer to think of your image when you're editing it. Welcome to the Flying Fruit Bowl, a platform dedicated to the discussion and exploration of art in the creative process. I'm your host, Arna, and in today's episode, I have the chance to talk to the incredible Ronnie Ackley. Ronnie is a photographer based in the West Midlands in the UK. His work explores the concepts of dereliction and how our throwaway society is impacting the cities we live in. Places that we all know and see in the daytime, but during early mornings, have a sense of uncanniness and disquiet. Right, Joe. Okay, then. So let's start where I start with everybody, which is just tell us a bit about yourself and how you became a photographer. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, thanks for inviting me. Um, my name is uh, Rani Ackling. I, uh, well, I grew up in, in Birmingham city centre in a place called Ladywood, very inner city. Um, I was a bit of a street urchin. I um, loved hanging around the canals and, and things like that. I um, I really got into, I was always a quite, a, quite a visual learner when I was younger and I was always drawing and things like that. So uh, as I progressed, I really got into graffiti. Um, I was, a lot of my friends did. So uh, we were painting walls when I was like 12 or 13. Um, then in school, I kind of, you could kind of get to know your strengths and weaknesses pretty quickly. And, and art and the visual side of things was pretty much a strength of mine. Um, uh I left school and then went to secondary school. I really enjoyed the art room. It was kind of a different place. You know, the art teachers are very different. Um, and I really enjoyed the kind of divergent way of thinking around that. Um, I left school and went to college and did graphic design and printing technology uh, as a diploma. And within that, I did some photography, uh, 35 millimeter oh, wow. dark room stuff, which was just incredible. Um, and then I took a bit of a break and then I start, I went to university. I did a teaching degree and, and honoured in, in art and design, uh, which where I continued my printing as well. because I'm, I'm mad on printing. Um, and I also did photography there. But, but then I became a teacher and worked my way up and became a senior leader in a, two primary schools. So I'm quite experienced, been teaching for 25 years. But. About seven or eight years ago, my, my father passed away and I had a, a road accident as well. And I kind of, it was a bit of a, a bit of a bad time. And then I needed, I needed an outlet. So I, I, I picked the camera back up. And I, uh, about seven, eight years ago, I really started to get into digital photography. And that's really where it started, kind of, the photography started for me. So that's how I got into photography. So that's really so. Just off the offset, that's really interesting because there's another photographer I've interviewed whose interview isn't out yet, called Cursed by Morrow, and he has a similar story oh. in the way of, I don't know if you know his work or if you know of him, but he had a similar story in which he had an accident, and because he had an accident, he couldn't really get out much, and because he can get out much, he took up photography, and that kind of helped him. And now you know he does these really incredible image, creates these really incredible images, um, and is highly regarded in the photography community. But it's kind of interesting how photography. And art, like essentially, uh, that's a question I'll, I'll ask you in a few minutes, but like the whole idea of kind of like photography being quite cathartic and quite, you know, it helps people. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I was, I was in a pretty bad place and I just thought it, it, I've always been creative and it was just a real, it was a, it was a calling really. And uh, I remember kind of my first, my first photographs were really naive and, you know, yeah. but uh, you learn, you learn, you know, you have to learn. And, and it was, what I really enjoyed was the solace of just wandering around streets curiously at like four or five in the morning in, in some really rough areas. And, but it's this, this kind of solace in that thing. So it's actually really funny. Cause I, I work, as I told you in a comment a while ago, I work at six in the morning. So I get up at quarter past four to yeah. go to work. So yesterday actually I took my camera out with me. It's the first time I've done it at four in the morning and I just wandered around to take some images before work. And I'm going to do it again tomorrow. It's great. But I, I, I know exactly what you mean because something nice about just having that moment kind of to yourself and, you know, is you kind of get to stand around and kind of rethink about how you experience the world because, you know, the thing with photography, and we'll get into this much later, but the thing with photography is that you're very much choosing how to capture the world. It's not just a case of you take an image. There's a lot of different layers to it. I think it seems so, 
It seems so easy, but it's not. And actually, that segues into the next question, I guess, for now. Also, I jump all over the place in terms of these questions, by the way. Don't worry. Don't worry. You've had, sure. Let's say you've had my previous interviews. You know how rambly and, and convoluted <laughs> this gets. Um, but I kind of guess I wanted to ask, like, do you think that society undervalues photography because it's so accessible? Um, the thing is, everyone's a photographer, aren't they? You know, you know, everyone's got their mobile phone out. Everyone, they, you know, you, you go to any concert, there's just a sea of mobile phones. Everyone's, you know, taking the visual. Um but I, I don't see, you know, there is an element where you know a good image when you see one. And um, and there's this thing, you, you, people say, oh, you've got an eye for it. And I, I'm not, that, I think that's the difference between a photographer and someone who just takes pictures. There is a difference between the two. Um, I don't know whether because it's more accessible, it becomes, it becomes, I suppose it becomes more saturated and devalued to some extent. But I think most people... You know, do they claim to be photographers or just do, do they just take pictures, you know? I'm not sure. That's a, a good kind of consideration because the way I look at it personally is I think you have image takers and you have image makers. And I think the general public are image takers. They just take images because they want to capture a memory or a moment to share with friends. And an image maker is somebody who creates an environment. They kind of create a story with their image. They kind of, their work is about more than just what they've taken. It's about, you know, the deeper meanings of something, even if they don't know it at the time. Um, so that's my opinion on it. That's how I see. Try to I just try to see it because um, I think there's a space for everybody. That's the thing. I think we should all be pretty inclusive. And if somebody wants to just you know take pictures on their iPhone and just snap images, then that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, but I'm not really interested in 25 photos of someone in Magaluf. If you get I mean, me. Oh no, I agree. So I agree. I think the problem is that because the digital space is now so um, present in our lives, like we've kind of confused the fact that. A digital album is not the same thing as a photography portfolio. They're not the same thing. Yeah. Some people are they are, but they're not the same thing. And and not just that, it's kind of like vacation photos are one thing and actual like actual photography is something different. Yeah. But hey, yeah, I digress. There's, there's got to be some like intrinsic value to what you're doing, you know, and, and you've got to create a, a, an engagement with the viewer and that's got to be on an emotional intrinsic value level for them to engage with it. And I don't think, you know, you're right with the image taker and image maker because the image maker does that. They 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 grab your attention through some some emotion or some some engagement somewhere. So, do you consider photography a form of art? Oh God, yeah, without a doubt, I love it, and it's it's incredibly expressive. It's uh, it's an incredible form of creativity. Um, it just formulating the image from walking around the area, from your location through to however you edit, crop, all of that is, is all part of the creative process to to engage someone someone else with what you've got. And surely that's what, because I'm really into kind of like, not just like elements of art, like visual art, or I'm really into like the creative strand within art, from whether it's someone creating a dish, a really nice bit of food, through to someone doing oh, a yeah. DJ set. You know, I think the creative stream, strand through what anybody does is really, really important. And I think photography is, is an incredible way to do that. That's actually a really good point because you said about like DJ sets. Like the, the good thing about photography is that it brings a lot of different people from, together from different kind of cultural mm -hmm. or different kind of areas of expertise. Like for instance, when I think of photography, I think of like filmmaking and music being two kind of very adjacent career choices or adjacent kind of cultures that photography is both involved in and separate from. So I think you, it's kind of, that's kind of an interesting consideration on your part, actually. Yeah, it's, it's all about the process, isn't it? The process of, you know, it, and, and and all art forms come through that process and the creative process is incredibly hard. And, you you know, you beat yourself up and it's, you know, oh, yeah. you know, you overcome problems and you're you know, you're a divergent thinker. It's, it's interesting. Yeah. So do you consider yourself to be a professional photographer? Oh, no way. I could only be a professional photographer if I could, if I could earn money off it, you know. I, do, I have sold a few, but I, I certainly can't make a living out of it, you know. Maybe when I die, someone will make some money out of it. I don't know. I think, <laughs> honestly, I'm not just saying just I'm talking to you, but I honestly think you could. I think with the right audience, like, I think like, every artist with the right audience could make yeah. money off their work. Sure. But I think you have to also remember you only need 100 people to give you a £1,000 as £100,000. So... If you think yeah, like that, that, it doesn't sound that impossible, really. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because loads of people say, oh, yeah, your work's great, you know. 
oh, I really like this series. I, I said, well, I do Prince, do you want to buy one? Well, you know, not so much, you know, because it's all really nice saying it, but when it comes to putting hands in pockets, like anything in the creative oh, world, yeah, it, it, it's almost like valueless sometimes, you know? I think also because essentially you're giving it to them for free by it being online as well. Sure. In many ways, you know, it's like, well, why would they want to pay for a print that on their wall when they can just sell on their phone if they want to just pick it up? You know, they yeah. can just save it, save your images, their wallpaper, and just look at it every day yeah. if they wanted to. You know, well, that kind of comes back to what you were talking about earlier. Does it does it devalue yeah. what people are doing with the amount of people who are having access to? But then I think I think then that kind of that kind of switches on the idea of like, well, what makes a photograph a piece of art? Because if you look at somebody like you know. Um, I'm assuming you know his wife, like Gregory Cruzdon, who is like obviously uh, right. a very a very famous art, quote unquote, art photographer. Like, what makes right. his images more valuable than, say, yours or say somebody else's? Well, you know, this is an age-old question, isn't it, yeah. about what the value on art really, and the, it's only it's only worth what someone's willing to pay. Yeah, if you get what Absolutely. I mean. You know, I mean, Mapple thought, why is his work yeah. worth work more than mine? Yeah. You know, totally different content but you know i guess it comes down to reputation that's what it comes down to yeah yeah and, and, and it's word oh, yeah. of mouth and it's people talking about it and it's it's all the vibe around it isn't it you know but it's funny because you say word of mouth yeah i don't think we really have that same kind of word of mouth conversations on the in the digital age anymore because it's all like let's share it and sharing is great it's, it's yeah. helpful but it doesn't mean that the artist's work you're sharing is going to benefit from that necessarily no you know no, you just think, get a few more likes yeah, which I think, you know, this is not meant to be all about technology, but this is, but it's, I guess it plays a large part in photography, especially. But I think we've all kind of confused the act of of sharing and liking as as if that's an actual support, when really that's just digital numbers that don't really mean much in the long term of a career. Yeah, you know? yeah. It's, it's literally just an offering, isn't it? You know, I mean, it's, it's welcome. But, oh, yeah. Know, <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm not saying don't, like, nobody would like any image, but yeah. For 25 putting my back pockets a bit bit more valuable to me at the moment. Like, like that's the thing. I think maybe we need to, I say we, like I can do anything about it, but maybe we need to just reframe the way we think about supporting the arts. Like social media is yeah. great, but I think it's kind of, it, it plays into the idea of you have to do the least amount of work. You know, like you you just liking yeah. something doesn't mean that you've added any, any value to anything. It means that yeah. you showed a little bit of support for a millisecond that you like something somebody did that you probably wasn't paying attention to because you're scrolling, you know, it's okay. kind of, I think, I don't, I don't be wrong. I'm not hating on social media because we wouldn't be doing this if it wasn't for social media, but Absolutely. it's kind of, it's kind of like, what well, you know, I think when it comes to art at least and the idea of sharing and the idea of like, you know, how can we actually raise the profiles of people who can actually get paid for their work? I think it's quite important to think about. Um, anyway. I, think, I think also a, a, lot, a lot of artists, playwrights through to whatever you create, a lot of people don't do it for the money. They That's do very it true. For the, the enjoyment of the process and also the, you know, the 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 outlet it gives you, you know, the, the engagement with other people and also the, the discussions you have around it, you know. Absolutely. People think it's, you know, uh, people think art's really, you know, hoity toity and highfalutin, but actually it's quite easy to say, yeah, I like it. And you don't have to explain why, you just really like something. It's fine. You know? Yeah. Absolutely, that's a good point. And not just that, you're right. I, I, obviously, obviously, for me, it's about the conversation. And I think you're very right, yeah. because I think you want, you want your work to say something to somebody and you want people to react to it. I think that's what like, you're creating so somebody reacts to the things you're creating, you know, and the, the yeah. ideas you're creating about. And I think if nobody talks to you about it or nobody has that conversation, it can just seem like you're creating just to create. And it's like, you want to you want to know how you impact people, I think is important, maybe. Yeah, you, you want to engage on some form of emotional level with people, I think. You know, because you could take a picture of a, you know, a subway and it's just, a, when you look at it, it's just a picture of a subway. But when it, when it's kind of contextualised or edited in a certain way, it gives a bit more of an, you know, an emotional attachment where people actually think, people actually walk down there, people actually use that subway, you know, and there's not, you know, you try and edit it so you can almost smell the place and it becomes a very different, you know, thing, doesn't it? And also, actually, the one interesting thing that I found recently is that it's easy to forget that not everybody sees the environment you're in. You know, like, yeah. I always, like, you know, if I walk past, like, a random car park, let's say, on the way to work, I'm always like, oh, that'd be boring to take a picture of because, you know, I see it every day. When I think, 
but there are people who follow me or are people who be looking at what I do have never seen that before. It's a completely new image to them. I think that's always something to remember because I feel like, I don't know, I look at a lot of stuff that I've got, that, and it's a question on later on, but I always look at like a lot of American photographers and I have a lot of American photographer friends and I kind of feel like that aesthetic for America is not here. So it kind of makes me feel like if I shoot images here, it, it didn't really seem right. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's kind of, well, I always but, forget. I think you're right though, because you, 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 it's hard to shoot somewhere in Britain, like like somewhere in America, because, yeah. you know, especially I, I, I know different. the kind of, photography you're probably talking about yeah. but because the mood's different the light's different you know the vastness of the place is different yeah but that doesn't take anything away from the fact that photographs in britain has its own mood there's something i'm starting to really kind of learn and i should really kind of lean into a bit and kind of realize like that's a good thing like that's yeah. you know it should be kind of just happy with where you're at and the fact that we can go out and take images and it's not an issue and you know we don't get stopped necessarily all that kind of stuff so <laughs> you know i don't know something that i'm kind of learning slowly as i get back into my own work at some point well i'm currently doing it now so you know um i don't know we'll see so yeah. what is the biggest challenge of being a photographer um well for me at the moment it's it's uh, well for one is time but also um kind of getting locations now um I'm, I'm struggling to to find new i'm in a bit of a rut anyway at the moment i haven't been out for a while i've I've kind of sat, saturated everywhere locally as such. So finding locations and finding inspiration is, is quite hard at the moment for, uh, for me. I mean, in this country as well, today's an exception, but for the last three weeks, it's been yes. incredibly great. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, so finding, absolutely. you know, so I'm, I'm thinking about going out at night and, and looking for some moody night pictures. I don't know. So I do like that kind of thing. But, you know, that, that's the challenge at the moment. But also the challenge is get, getting people to engage with your work and, you know, and, 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 and you know, discuss it on a, on a decent level rather than, as you say, just likes and I like the mood. That's a good one, isn't it, on Instagram? Great mood. <laughs> I don't quite know what that means. Yeah, because they're there. But like, can you follow up saying, so what mood does it put you in? Or like, yeah, yeah. Kind of this up? because, you know, it, it can be frustrating because, you know, this is time you've spent, you know, if you spent time going out, you spent time taking pictures, you spent time selecting, you spent time editing, you spent time yeah. organizing, planning, archiving, all that kind of stuff. And someone's like, great mood. And you're like, what does that mean? <laughs> you know? Don't get me wrong. I'm, 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 I'm glad they say something. Yes. I really am. And, I, and all of those things you said, I really enjoy doing. Yeah. Like, you know, that, it, it's, a, it's a pleasure to do those things. So, you know. But, but I think it's also interesting because there are a lot of behind the scenes stuff that we don't really show. Like, you know, I'm yeah. always really curious of them. I'm at the minute, I'm very curious about photographers contact sheets. I really want to see what people have shot in like a full length of their, when they go out at like the session. I'm like, I'm really interested to see what failed, what, what was really good, what went hideously yeah. badly. How many underexposed or overexposed images did you have? You know, like how, yeah. you know, how much work does it take to get this one shot that you're proud of? Because I think but, we yeah, don't show like, that. You know, four to 500 images on a digital oh, yeah. strip and, and and get literally get one or two if you're lucky you know that's the thing and i feel like we kind of do ourselves a disservice because we don't show that yeah you know yeah. and i think I it's, it's it's kind of crazy when you think about it because you know we see artists and quote-unquote painters or just artists in general and you know we see their creative process from top to bottom we see everything they do but with photographers it's just like oh here is the location here's the final image or here's the edit before and after or like you know Particularly when I think about like yeah. Instagram Reels and stuff, and you know, which is like a whole oh. different, whole different ball game. But when I think about stuff like that, it's just like portfolio, it's like portfolios, or it's like before and afters. Like that's kind of it. There's no, this is my setup. This is you know my routine. There probably is. I'm probably not saying it. There's no like, like this is my routine. This is my content sheet. These are the stuff I didn't like. You know, I want more transparency yeah, yeah. personally. I also think you know you you are right when you look at or get to know artists you, if you ever get a chance to meet them if you ever get a chance to look at their sketchbooks and their process you 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 really get you really get to appreciate the, the hard work and the, the angst that goes into creating things and photography is exactly the same you know I've got a hard drive full of thousands of images that I think are particularly rubbish but um, other people might look at that and think well you, you know why don't you edit it this way or share it this way or you know. I know for a fact you've got absolute gold in that archive. I can tell you right now you have. I already know yeah. you have. 
<laughs> like I already know. Yeah. Like, 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 like this is a thing. It comes. It comes back to perspective. It's like just because you have shot those images, you think they're a certain way. Doesn't mean everybody else is going to think the same thing. You know, like the amount of stuff you think is like, oh, this is rubbish. It didn't go right. I can guarantee you people are going to look at that and be like, this is amazing. Or like, this is so interesting or this is so different. So yeah. I think it's, yeah, I think right. it's always worth sharing stuff from your archive. Just grab five, six images, shoot them into a reel. There you go. There's content for the next year. There you go. You don't even have to worry about it. Like that's yeah, the you're thing. Probably right. You're quite savvy with the technology. You see. Well, listen, you know, if you I'm, ever need a hand at any of that stuff, come give me a shout. I'm always happy to help. Oh, like, yeah. Because yeah, um, cool. it's, something, cause it's something that I'm trying to get. I'm trying to ask a lot of artists. One of my artist friends was like, don't do it. But I was like, I'd be, I'd be happy to create reels for artists for them because at the end of the day, like, mm. I want to free up people's time. Like it's something, it's part of what I do for the fine free world anyway. Like I'm doing that on a day-to-day basis. So for mm. me to, to add a few more videos, it's not going to bother me. It takes me like, what, 20 minutes maybe? So it's not an issue. It's not like it's going to take forever. So you honestly, no, I always say, no, the way, so the way I've got it in my mind is like, just pay what you want. It's going to be a pay what you want service. Like, pay what you want, pay what you think mm. it's worth. I don't care because it's not about the money. It's about the time I'm, I'm helping you not have to spend doing that if you're not sure how to do it or if you don't want to do it or if you're just not interested, you know? But you I still get the end result. Hey, listen. I give you a that's, <laughs> like, that's like an open invitation to any artist. And I know that probably sounds very terrible to say, but it's true because like I'm very, very you aware. Might be, it's because you might be making a run for your own back here, you know? Probably, but that's my life anyway, so it's fine. Um, you know, I have a full-time job when I do this, which is almost a second full-time job. So, you know, it's yeah. kind of like, I'm already busy enough. I don't need, it's fine if I'm more busy. I'm, I'm the kind of person, as I have a really cool friend that I met not so long ago, who's the same. It's like the way I kind of get out working more is to work more because that yeah. makes more sense. And not just that, like I've got holidays set aside for me, for myself. So I've got photo shoots planned in a few different cities. That is going to be my break from working. But until then I can just work totally because it's not going to bother me. So my next question for you then is there's a photographer that I talked to who is from Spain. Um, it's called I Am Surrounded By. Um, anybody I mention, I'll send you the links to. Um, right. I, I didn't actually write it to send list, but that's fine. I've got plenty of people I can send you. Um, and a while ago, we were talking about this idea of artists being introverted and extroverted and like how that plays a role right. in their work. So I'm kind of curious, like, would you say you're more introverted or extroverted or maybe both? And like, how does that play a role in kind of the image you create? So really, I think I'm going the kind of introverted, introverted side of things. But as a person, I can be quite, you know, sometimes a bit overconfident and a bit, bit brash. But my work really is easy. I'm a bit of a lone wolf when I, when I go out. You know, I, I like things. Uh, I like to do things on my own. And I, I like, I mean, the mood I try and get is very kind of, yeah, almost desolate and, and things like that. So really, I think, I think. My, the, the way I come through my work is very much through a, an introverted way. I, I really struggle with um, talking about my work. I, you know, I, I recently did an exhibition and I, I felt I feel really a lot of pressure, you know, when people start to talk to you about it and, and you have to try and explain things in, on, on an artistic level. And it, it's quite hard, you know, because um, really I just you just go and point the camera and hopefully it works out. <laughs> But, you know, there's, but there's more to it than that. But do you get what I mean? But from an introvert, I'm very much an introverted person when it comes to talking about my work as well, you know, because I, I prefer other people to do that. And I'll just go, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> it's hard. Um, but, yeah, I th- you know, I don't know. I definitely wouldn't be extroverted with my with my work. I don't think. It's, it's hard to explain that one. It's, it's a good question. Isn't it? It is. So the yeah. thing the thing about that is that a lot of artists I talk to are introverted. And it, it shows in their work because in their work they're trying to build worlds because like it's a world that they're comfortable to fit in as opposed to the world that we exist in. Um and I kind of feel like to me it's very obvious because I say obvious, it's not obvious, obvious, but it, it could be very obvious because it's like your work, as you said, is very desolate. It's very kind of like I, it's exactly what it is in terms of like, you know, early mornings walking around yeah. when there's nobody around, just kind of observing the city and kind of being that kind of outsider in terms of looking at the environment you're within. Um, and it's, it's, it's fun for me because you're very local to me. I live in Coventry. So okay. you're, yeah. So you're only a bus ride away, a train ride away. So that's really interesting. Yeah. So I was very, very yeah, curious about cool. your work because I was like, Oh, it's in Birmingham. And I was like, how the hell is this Birmingham? Like this is not the Birmingham <laughs> I know. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I- I mean, I don't take pictures of the, um, you know, the the rotunda or that, that 
that god awful Selfridges building or anything like that. You know, that's been done to death. I mean, I'd much prefer to, you know, and I, I, this links to kind of the introverted way of, of, of being going outside the the city centre and do the do just the outskirts where the you know the the industrial side of things are and the working class side of things are. You know, where the, the secrets lie really, not not where the big city centre is and the glitz and the glamour. That that's been done to death, isn't it? So that's so true because I've never, particularly in Birmingham, I've never been to the outskirts of Birmingham. I've only ever been, as you can imagine, to the ball ring because that's the only reason I need to ever go there. I'll take you to Smethwick. Smethwick's one of my favourite places. Hey, look, I'd Incredible. absolutely love to meet up and go on a photo walk with you. That'd be so awesome. Uh, that has to go on my bucket list for this year, for sure. It has to happen. We'll do uh, it. I'd love to do that. That'd be great. Um, and also because you're so close, it's like, that's even better. It's not like it's going to be like yeah. a huge problem. And hey, who doesn't like walking around at three in the morning? I mean... <laughs> Honestly, I don't think I don't think people understand. Like, yes, okay, getting up stupidly early is a struggle, but getting outside in the morning at like five in the morning when there's nobody else around is one of the best things ever. Because it's, it's, it's amazing. It's just so liberating, um, and you have to see it yeah. yourself, and it's so interesting. You know, it's, it's also the, the, the sounds of the place because the city centre, you know, has it's gone dead. Really, you get the odd person who's doing the walk of shame. You know, who's yeah. still going out at, you know, five in the morning and stuff. Yeah. But the whole feel of and the light is totally different in yeah. the morning to, to any other time of day, you know. Absolutely. Especially in Birmingham, they call it the Brum Rise, you know, because we're very central in England. It's very different to any other part of the country. I'll have to experience that. That sounds really interesting. I didn't yeah, know that. Do it. Right, okay. So let's get into your work, actually. For those who may not have seen it, could you just please give us an overview of the type of work you create? Um, Really enjoy a kind of uh, cityscapes. Um, I like dereliction. I like subways. Um, I really like. When I was growing up. I really like tower blocks and inner city areas. So it's kind of it's almost like a, a documentary. But I try to look at um, kind of downtrodden areas, but try and give them a, 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 a new light, a different way of looking at them. Um, sometimes a little mundane. I think there's beauty and simplicity as well. Um, so really, it, it's about it, it's about inner city life and areas, really. But on a it's just just taking maybe a different angle on that. That's what I try to do. It's like observing the everyday, really. Yeah, kind of. But hopefully, with nobody in it, um, because I find when people are, mind you, it's nice to have people in photographs. Sometimes it depends on. Um, what you're trying to what you're trying to create, but I I do like um, inner city areas without people. I kind of I think it adds to kind of the, the loneliness of the place and the the mood you're trying to get. You know, oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the thing about that is that because we don't normally see cities in that state without people in them, we always mm -hmm. see them quite busy. And, and obviously, being a part of that city as well, you yeah, kind of get, you can get caught up in that. It's almost like taking the life out of of, of the city, really. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm always interested in what the regular everyday person has to do. I'll, you know, whether they have to use a subway to to get to, to another part of town. I'm, I'm quite interested in the you know the the roads that they tread as well, without the joy of a car and things like that. Because when you show other people that, they they sometimes a little bit shocked about what what's going on around them that they don't experience themselves. You know, I mean, I, I took a bit of picture not, not long ago and there was a, a shopping trolley just abandoned in a, yes. in a subway. And I, I just found that juxtaposition really interesting. And, you know, the, the fact that the shopping trolley should be somewhere else and the story of the shopping trolley getting there. And, you know, and that, that was, I just stumbled across that, you know. I was lucky enough to, to have that experience and to share it. Other people found it really interesting as well. You know. See that's fascinating. This idea of displacement, that's really interesting. Like this idea of you being displaced in a city or like the idea of kind of things being displaced in a city. And that's actually a really interesting kind of consideration because yeah. that makes me kind of think about like, you're right, you did experience that. And rather than just ignore it, you captured it and then you shared that. And then because you shared that, it, it kind of makes other people reflect very differently because, you know, that's a whole story by itself, like how it got there. And, you know, yeah. that's a story you don't know the answer to. So it's you kind of like opening up the kind of ambiguity for the for the viewers to kind of ask, you know, what went on here? You know, what yeah, was yeah. the what will happen before this? There's a juxtaposition, isn't there, really, of that 
of that object being there and and it shouldn't be there and you know who who put it there there's all these stories but I, then i become a little bit obsessed with shopping trolleys and they pop up in my work now but also like traffic cones i find traffic cones end up in the most bizarre places and i don't know why and chairs do as well random chairs i found a, a chair the other day with someone tagged it uh, graffiti in a cornfield and it was i, I have no idea how he got bizarre. there yeah but like, it's great but like that's the mystery of it that's the beauty of it is that like you kind of have to guess because you don't know the answer yeah you know? and also it's i think that's really interesting because these are not things you plan it's not like you're creating these you're you're making you're saying oh let's put a chair in this comfort these are things you're stumbling across so some, people, says, do, some people do think i do and do they? yeah yeah and as if i walk you know drive around with shopping trolleys <laughs> in my <laughs> You know, just, just dropping them in places, you know. But like, that kind of says a lot about the city, though. I think, in a way, yeah. So yeah. I was like, that's that's bizarre. I mean, did that happen here? It's, it's, it it's also we live in a throwaway society, you know. Yeah. So these things that we just end up yeah. anywhere, like random TVs and stuff. And actually, we, yeah, actually, that's really interesting because shopping trolleys and traffic cones are not our property. They're not things that we would own. Yeah. So that's actually a really, again, another good consideration. And actually that's the idea of um, looking at it as a thorough culture, like that's such a good perspective on your work. Because I think it's not one that is deliberate or is one that is kind of like necessarily obvious. But I think that, now you said that, I'm like, actually that makes so much sense. Because you're right, it's a huge comment on our society in the way that, you know, we are going more technology advanced and the fact that we find particularly old analog things, things that we have to use and have to move, we abandon them. You know, yeah. it's like, you know, shopping trolleys, you have to move around with a shopping trolley. You know, traffic cones, you have to go around traffic cones. You know, they're, <laughs> they're kind of, in a very many ways, they're very symbolic of things that maybe we don't think about. Yeah. That's, that's a really good consideration. And, so, and when you put them out of context, they're completely useless. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have no but, use being in a yeah. subway. You know? Yeah. But also, a, a shopping trolley is worth more than the pound you put in it. Yes, and that's really, true, actually. That's very there's, true. There's money in scrap there. <laughs> that's true actually I don't I'm know actually... why people take them back just gonna go, and, more go and, <laughs> gonna go and collect a load of shopping trolleys now and be like, hmm. yeah. <laughs> like how did you yeah, get yeah. rich quick I'd be like ah. yeah. that's, hmm. get arrested be careful I mean you only live once right apparently of course, um, of so what do you think we learn by looking at images of our environment and uh, why do you think landscapes especially are important in art oh well you know I mean the landscape's ever changing, especially in cities. I and mean, if you look at where I, I go a lot into Birmingham, it's an ever changing city. It used yeah. to be just like amazing concrete place full of subways. It's like false utopia of, you know, the traffic took over, but society can still function by people going underneath the ground to get to other places. And it soon worked out that it doesn't work at all. Um, so landscapes and cityscapes to, to constantly document them and take pictures of them is really really important it, it's so inspiring sometimes to uh be out and experience the change that goes on all the time even over several months you can revisit a new like the same location and it could be very different you know yeah that's true that's very true actually i think you're right and and i know you said previously that you look at your work as documentary but is it just as artistic as it is documentarian or is it more documentarian would you say i think i think what you try and do is you try and document things but in an artistic way yeah you know I, really my, my images i want people to have on their wall you know yeah they're not, they're not they're not there kind of to document things as such but they're there to be to, to represent time but maybe in an artistic interesting way um I don't think I'm a, a documentary photographer, though. Um, people are much better at that than I am. I, but I kind of wonder, like, what is the line between documentarian work and artistic work? Because yeah. one could argue they're the same thing if done in the correct way. I think you're right. I mean, you know, um, I don't know whether you know John Bol Bolton or Bol Bol I think it's Bolton. Yeah. He's a documentary photographer. And he just, you know, he, he gets involved with the uh, travelling community and, you know, bare knuckle fighting and things like that. And some of those images are absolutely raw and incredible. And I would have them on my wall, you know, and he produces these little books about it, which is great documentary work. But it is artistic as well, I think, because it's done in such an incredible way. You know? Would you ever create a photo book, actually? Yeah. 
Yeah, I um, I've been part of a few, but just bit parts. But I would do my own one. Yeah, definitely. But I've just got to think about a theme. I mean, you know, what a, it depends what a, what angle I want to take with it. Well, yeah, sure, why not? Because one thing that um, I keep saying to a lot of photographers that I probably shouldn't keep saying, and I probably could this better this episode because I keep saying it <laughs> on interviews and I probably shouldn't be saying it. But one thing I want to do in the next three to five years, I give myself a time frame, um, mm. is create a photo book for photographers, create like a really cool, thick, like, you know, coffee table yeah. photo book of just photographers' work and have like a nice catalogue of people's work because everybody I know and I speak to, everybody wants their work in print. Yeah, but, yeah. But, and everybody wants to create a book. So I was like, well, why don't I... I don't know why I bestowed, I bestowed the opportunity on myself, but why don't I just create a photo book? Because I know so many people, you know, I know people would want to have their work in a, in a physical format. Like, why would that not be a good idea? Like, that could be a good way for me to, you know, um, give back to the people that I've spoken to, you know? But also, could be cool. what, you do, what you're doing there is exactly celebrating the documentary of artistic work. So yeah. you're, that, within that element, there's a documentation of artistic interpretation. So, yeah, it's that's a very much better. It's something that I'm really like, I'm really serious about doing. And that's why I give myself three to five years to save money for it. It's going to be expensive. Um, yeah. But also just because it's something that I think would be really worthwhile doing. Like it's not even about, I don't care about turning a profit. I care about, you know, getting people's work in print because of what they want, you know, and they may not have the opportunity think, to do that. I think people would buy it though. Everyone loves tangible, you know, yeah. something you can hold, something you can feel. I mean, I was bought, um, is it Philip Penman, Penman, the New York photographer, someone bought me his book and, I just keep going back to it to just yes. you know look at it and feel that you know he, he walked those streets you know it comes through the pages it's incredible yeah. absolutely yeah I, I would definitely love to see your work in print i think it'll be so good i think it'd be really really good actually i think it'll be yeah. it'll be good i think yeah you deserve it absolutely your work deserves yeah. it at least <laughs> really Thanks, no, well, we, I, should, we should stick it alongside some of your american friends as well you know let's get that uh, position so what i'm going to do is um i'm going to send you a very long list of people um to look at because a lot i think 90 percent of the people i speak to actually no, probably more like 97 percent of the photographers i speak to are american which is funny because that means i don't go sleep at a decent hour because it's stupid time zones but um that's <laughs> why i'm always tired i blame them um but i'm going to send you a bunch of people's work because what i actually did actually yesterday because nick barkworth posted a reel and i really loved his reel I thought it was really interesting. It was, I don't know if you saw it. I have no idea if you follow his work. That Not much, the one of the seagull walking around, was it? No, no, no. It was um, just a, a small footage of inside of a diner. And then I had like, it had the image that had the video that went alongside it. It was like oh, two yeah. of them. And I really loved it. I thought it was incredible. Uh, so I shared it with as many people as I can because I do that kind of thing. I'm the really annoying person who, if I see something, I've got about 20 people I'll send it to. Like without any explanation, just send it to people because I want people to see it. And it's important. That's what yeah, you know you like want to do. So I'm totally going to do it with you and your work because I'm going to literally send it to everybody I know because people need to say it. So, it's and also it's cool as well because like, I can be like, yo, you know, us, us British people can also take good images too, you know, <laughs> you know, so, you know, yeah, there's also yeah. that. So I'm going to he do takes, that. I need to... He takes some great images inside cafes though. You know, his interiors are equally as good as his, uh, you know, his street stuff. And... A lot of your work is exteriors, you know, cityscapes, the outside environment. But like, do you actually shoot interiors and or is that something you want to do? I, it, it kind of links a little bit to what we were talking about, kind of, I mean, kind of nostalgic cafes and things like that. I took a picture, I was in um, Bath of all places and I went inside a market wow. and there was um, a little indoor cafe and it was the cleanest cafe I'd ever seen. <laughs> and all, all of the little pots, <laughs> all of the little tomato ketchup pots and, you know, condiments were set out and everything was equidistant. And it was just a beautiful, you know, yeah. balanced, symmetrical. So I, I took about 30 or 40 pictures of it. And the um, the cafe owner kept popping his head out. And he, was, he was a bit bemused by the why I was taking photos of such a boring um, but I was I was obsessed with it, and I, I changed my settings. I was you know, all over it, and I managed to get one one decent photo, which I quite liked. But it's um, yeah, but it's really mundane and it's really boring, but it's really pleasing on the eye, and the coloration was good. So I think that if you can get that in an interior, you know, I mean, I think film lends itself well uh, to interiors. Getting the digital settings right can be tricky, I think, sometimes. Yeah. You know, um, 
but I, I'd like to do more if I can find the right interiors because I like I like them to look nostalgic or a certain mood to them really. And kind of like, why do you think nostalgia is important? Oh, it just brings it brings the history back, doesn't it? You know, everybody knows going to like seaside areas when they were little. I want to bring those feelings and memories back of sitting in cafes when you were little with mum and dad and things like that, you know. And I love like the the full mica and the plastic and you know that you know every picture in the seventies had that like orange tinge yeah. to it. Yeah. yeah, that I want that. I love that. You know, but I find it very interesting because I feel like what's going to happen in the future because this here today is going to be somebody's nostalgia yeah exactly like so, that's bizarre yeah i talk about this quite often with other people when when do things become nostalgic is there a time limit on that you know i mean old nintendos now are sometimes nostalgic aren't they you know nintendos are absolutely yeah and sega mega drives and things like that you know when i was younger they were modern but yeah. the look of them now you know, they look dated, but there's a nostalgic feel around them, you know? So I don't know. There's no time limit on it, is there? There's not. That's a good question, actually. That's a question I'm going to ask somebody in the future, I think. Um, yeah. Actually. Now, what's the time limit on nostalgia? That might be your question for the next artist, potentially. It can't be two weeks. It can't be two years. It's got to be longer than <laughs> Two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? It's got to be more than, you know. It, I feel like, I don't know, because I feel like, with the world of the minute, like with music, we've got a weird kind of disco house, synth wave, 80s yeah, and yeah, 90s yeah. kind of revival point of contemporary music, which is I like. I'm a huge fan of house, so that's cool. But yeah. it seems to be really strange because then we also have, at the same time, we also have like, this whole kind of 90s throwback vibe in kind of just like everyday life and, and kind of the idea of, you know, sure. even like Instagram filters and whatever and all that kind of stuff. And I don't yeah. know, there just seems to be... All these Something Kodak about filters, and that. all yeah. these Kodak filters, and things like that. Yeah. You no, know, and I, I blame Stranger Things to some extent. Oh yeah, no. Well, so I, th- I think really, I think the producer of Stranger Things did a good job of making it seem like people can blame Stranger Things when really I think it was deliberately done because yeah. I've never seen Stranger Things and I probably never will because I don't care for stuff that's overhyped. But I kind of <laughs> feel like. I've heard, obviously, it's very kind of 80s, very 90s. It's very nostalgic. But I feel like that was done deliberately because nostalgia sells at the oh, end yeah. of the day. So oh, it's, it's, it's done, and it's done very well. But that's only nostalgic to people who lived through the 80s. Can you but, be nostalgic about things you didn't live? Yes, of course you can. People people are, clearly. Really? Well, people must be if Stranger Things was a hit. Yeah, but did they feel that real nostalgia about the roller boots they were wearing, you know? That's true. See, that's a good point. Like, what level of nostalgia are you feeling? Yeah. That's a good question. That's a very good question, actually. We do a whole podcast about nostalgia. Well, maybe <laughs> I should, actually. Oh, actually, wait. Okay, so this is a little aside. So one thing that I am planning to do in the future, because um, <laughs> I've always planned to do I've got so many plans, it's not even funny. Um, to the point that I don't know why I'm giving myself more work, because I have no time to actually post anything, because I already post six to seven days a week. So I don't know when I'm going to post anything else. But one thing I want to do is artist panel discussions. I want to get three or four different artists together or like maybe a Zoom call with us with the topic and have them discuss that topic. Yeah. Um, yeah only, good. you know, only for like 20, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, like completely unedited, like kind of one take thing, that kind of thing. You yeah. know, video video and everything, because I want people to have their faces out there because people are good at hiding behind screens. So Yeah, I think you'd have to put very carefully because you know that you, you want people to disagree as well, don't you? Yes. Well, you yes, and uh, yes or no. I think yes, but also no, because I feel like Oh, I don't know. I haven't thought about it fully yet. As you can, that's why it's like in the future. Like, yes, you're right. I don't want people to disagree, but then I don't want people to argue because that's not what it's about. Yeah. It's about having a conversation more than anything else. So, if that's something you're interested in doing in the future, let me know because uh, sure. I'm always interested in. It's something I really want to start next year for sure. So, I want to test the later on in a few months whenever I got the time, when I'm not on holiday and I'm not doing anything else in my life because uh, cool. who knows? Um, also, I'm, I'm assuming as well, just as a random aside, like you've heard about liminal spaces. I've heard of what? I have liminal spaces. What's that? Liminal spaces? No. Do, I don't. You've, you've never heard of liminal spaces? No. Oh my goodness. I'm going to send you a lot of cool stuff. So, liminal spaces are stuff like subways, stuff like shopping malls, stuff right. where people normally occupy when they're empty. And, oh, it's yeah. I, and this idea that they're kind of these weird transient places that kind of 
exist um there's a whole there's like a whole community there's a whole kind of like yeah send me some links it sounds fascinating what i could not believe you have not heard of this this is like insane i guess uh, i'm old <laughs> I, um i don't know still it's just i'm should i don't know you should still probably have heard of it <laughs> to be honest should, you know but i'm a busy man no no yeah. fair enough i mean i said that's the good point because i say it like we've got the time to browse the internet like all day when we don't so you know and also i also forget like people with technological technological skills are very different just because i'm on the internet all day doesn't mean you're going to be on the internet all day you know it's like it's like my mother who has no idea how to use internet and it's like good you don't need to perfect you know it's kind of like it's like i forget that not everybody cares about the internet in the way that the my, my generation i guess does um yeah you're also, right you're absolutely right. and actually and that and that this is like a random size i'm gonna cut this out but like that kind of is also why i feel like a lot of artists particularly older artists feel a lot more pressure to have to create more content because it comes very naturally to younger people because they've grown up in that but also older people just don't care that much about it because you care about creating work you care about you know the beauty of the art not the views it's going to get whereas in the younger generation just care about numbers it's and also the, the older you get the more you have to relearn and you, you know that's it's true not, you know younger younger adults especially just pick it up and it's a it's an ongoing process older people have to relearn and, and you know constantly it's true. work harder to do it and, and not just that like when you're older you just don't care as much like there's so many things yeah. i just don't care about now that i'm older that i probably cared about five years ago that i just don't care about like yeah. your priorities change you know absolutely yeah i think that's and i think that's something that we always forget in terms of like when we look at numbers and we look at figures and we want to grow and we want to build more of an audience like well not everyone has the same time to do that so you know you can't be like annoyed at yourself if it seems like these other photographers are getting more kind of quote unquote fame because they've probably got more to dedicate to it you know? you know i don't know i think it's hard to co- i don't like uh some people compare success yes. with, with followers and likes you know when someone who could have like 50 followers it's just a, the most incredible work oh you know? oh Absolutely, you know the, I mean? yeah. And a lot of people, a lot of people now buy followers, and you know they've got twenty thousand yeah. followers, but then they get twenty likes each photo. Yeah. I think, I think there's this element of fakery. Oh yeah, absolutely. And yeah. there's there's so many photographers I found that have like maybe like three hundred followers, and I'm like these people's work are insane, you know. Yeah. And like they're the photographers that I go for. I'm like I want to talk. I want to you know, I want to interview you, and I want to talk to you about your work. And I'm always like, oh, let me talk to you. Because it's important. Because it's it's nice that when you're starting out to be discovered and feel like you're you're making a difference. Because everyone's making a difference. They just don't realize it, and it can yeah. be very hard to get lost in the whole kind of Instagram mix of like constant greatness. You know. Yeah, I see people try rather than being true to their own style of photography, they they constantly try different things, mm. and it, it doesn't seem to work. You but you've got to be true to what you want to, what, what what you feel comfortable with. You know. That's true. So go back to your work, actually. So do you work in a series or do you consider your work to be one ongoing body of work? Uh, really, it's, it's, it's an ongoing process. I um, the, the way I work is I'll, I'll pick a time and a place where I'll go out and I may walk for miles and miles and miles and end up somewhere where I didn't start, if you get what I mean. But I will I will take four to 500 images Um a lot of them might be throwaway images, but um, you never know until you get back. And you, I mean, that's the great thing about digital photography now. You know, if I was running film photography, it'd be a very, very different matter. <laughs> I certainly wouldn't be doing that many. But um, yeah, I think it's all about you know, it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing project. You know, for me anyway, it's about exploration of different places and you know, and, and different effects I can create. Because I think it's, I only asked because when I looked at your work and I kind of went right through it, I kind of thought like, like how do you differentiate like one set of images to another? Or do you not bother to, do you not, does it not bother you that, you know, say like you shot this image in Bath, maybe you shot this one in, you know, I don't know, Birmingham, you know? Yeah, I mean, I generally put up, because someone once said to me, you're in charge of your wall, you know, you're in charge of your gallery, yeah. you can put the hell you like up. Yeah, of course. It's up, to, it's up to you. So I generally, I mean... I put up what I, what I think is interesting. So if that is a cafe in Bath, or if that's uh, the Grand Pier in um, Western Supermare, then that, that's the way it is. But I think the similarities in 
what I, the, the way I capture things and the, 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 the filters I use and the mood I'm trying to get. I think the similarities between that. But do you ever worry about your work being repetitive? Um, I have done in the past. I know, I know some people do the same thing over and over again. Yeah. And to me, it's, it's been like being a DJ and playing the same record over and over again, or the same type of music. I think, I don't know. I'd, 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 I'd like to mix it up a bit, you know. I like street photography. I used to really enjoy street photography, but I've got... Uh, I think a lot of people think they're street photographers, but they just take pe- pictures of people on the street. You know, do you, I, I can see you laugh. You know, e- everyone's a street photographer, aren't they? Yeah. And they take pictures of people on the street. It's the same yeah. in many ways with the fashion photography. Everyone takes pictures of people wearing clothes. Doesn't mean it's fashion photography. Uh, exactly. I mean, there's some street photography. There's a there's a woman in Singapore called Betty Guff. Go, Betty Go, I think her name is. And she started on Instagram more or less when I did. And she uses really kind of great reflective work and abstract figures and things. And there's tension in it and there's interest and things like that, you know. Um, and that's good street photography, you know, that that interests me. But um, I don't know. So just taking a picture down New Street in Birmingham and saying street photography, I, I struggle with because it's, it's not. There's no tension. There's no There's no engagement for me so it's about so really it's about the story and it's about kind of um i guess the unspoken drama of the image yes there's got, there's got to be there's got to be questions around it you've got to wonder why and how and there, there could be a look between two people or there could be a strange shadow somewhere that just offers a bit of you know a bit of abstract or some tension somewhere in the image you know or, or even coloration and things like that so if you can shoot anywhere, where would you shoot? Um, I'm going back to Port Talbot. Um, I don't know when, because there's another artist there. He's, he's, his handle's called Mongo Gucci, and he does a lot of digital art, um, and he does pop stars and things like that. But he started following me after I started uh, putting up some work, and I really like He's a photographer as well. So when I go back down, I'll, I'll grab a point with him, and he can take me around some places. But I'm definitely going back there. Um but I, I, I'll still be visiting seaside towns, maybe slightly out of season. I think, I think it's more interesting out of season. Um, but I haven't got, I'm also off to um, Lanzarote soon. And I, I really like it. Oh, wow. The volcanic element to it. And it's, you, you can't build over three stories there. So the views are great and very flat. And there's a lot of kind of, interesting graphics to be had there with the white buildings and things there's some great minimalist stuff you can do with the white buildings so see i really like minimal photography as well some of that's just fascinating so i might experiment with a bit of that oh, that's a great idea just give me a load of ideas for people to send to you <laughs> you're just making notes now <laughs> i'm making a list of people to send to you um, because there's a bunch of people I, I follow that have that do really gorgeous minimal photography they're just oh, like really sim- really simple but they're really effective because they're so simple and yeah. I think we we often forget that a good image doesn't have to be complicated no nope. you know we, I think it's so easy to forget that and the human eye and the, the human brain loves um symmetry and balance and you know, the golden circle, the rule of thirds yeah. and things like that. And for, so good photographers use that really well and it's really engaging. So let's get into your creative process slightly. So do you have any particular routines that help you focus on your work? Um, rout- routines as in the, the way I approach my work? Yes. Yeah, like times, the way you approach your work, yeah. Yeah, times of day is really important. I, I really struggle with summer because um, the sun comes up way too early. Yes. Um, and goes to bed far too late so i really like going out when it's freezing cold in the winter no, no so how how <laughs> i just like, like how? i absolutely love it especially when it's frosty and, and, and really cold because the so, light is amazing so well, maybe i should try that because i feel like i hate the cold <laughs> i absolutely hate the cold i'm not i'm not a fan of the cold whatsoever i'm also not a fan of the the summer either i'm just i like autumn autumn is the best month yeah um, it's we, good but it's i think that's actually a really interesting con- consideration because like you're going to take images that not everybody else is taking because you're taking the effort to get up that early to go out yeah. in these conditions and it's like 
like I myself would probably never do what I would, but I wouldn't really, it's not going to be what I'd want to do. I wouldn't be saying I love it personally. But, but that's what might that might that's what might surprise some people that actually that place looks like that at that time of the day. Yes, absolutely. You, know? you should but, go to Iceland. I should, you know. Because I've always it. I've always said I'd love to go to Iceland, but I hate the cold, so it's probably never gonna happen. <laughs> it's expensive as well. Yeah, but you know, it's an experience, isn't it? You'll save cool. up for that. And you know, end of the day, it's gonna be a once in a lifetime trip. Maybe not once in a lifetime, but like a lifetime, like a, an experience. So yeah, it you would know, be and good. I, and I kind of feel like, yeah, things are expensive, but hey, the cost of living is going up, so everything's expensive nowadays. You <laughs> know, uh, yeah, four points of milk is expensive. You know, I mean, yeah, it's, it's insane. So, you but, know, um, just going back to the creative process, yes. I'm really, really into editing. I'm, I've really learned how to use Lightroom, um, and that that's the artistic part for me massively. I really, I can't tell you how much I how much I enjoy editing photos some really? people hate it yeah i i'll spend some sunday afternoon I'll, I'll have a couple of beers and i'll spend hours going over old photos or new content uh trying different things it's it's great I, I, you know it's that's the artistic process it's like painting a picture it's like yeah you know sculpting something it's, it's that's where your mood comes from you know that's the what i really enjoy I think within editing those, right, you've got to be really careful because some people take it too far and, and the, the the image becomes lost within the edit, you know. And I, I, do, I do use Lightroom and I, I really enjoy it, but I'm quite conscious about going beyond reality. You've got to be kind of careful about how you want that image to be perceived. And some people make it look hyper real, or, yeah. you know, and it's 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 beyond the human eye, you know. It, it, look, it looks bizarre sometimes, but I know what they're trying to do. But it's just not my. I think there has to be a certain element of realism. I mean, Photoshop is another thing that's quite scary, you know. People manipulate things. It's not. It's not true to what what it's meant to be. I think it goes beyond the realms of reality sometimes. Like that's an interesting consideration because one of the things I love, one of the things I really love to discuss or to think about is the idea of photographic reality because you're taking an, an image from the world we live in, but then once you take a picture of it, it doesn't become the world we live in, it becomes its own reality yeah. because, and then also through editing, you make it your own. So like, do you kind of consider the work that you create to be the world we live in or your own world? I do, one would say it's an embellished interpretation of what I see, yeah. but not to the point of, you know, a hyper, hyper reality or something. Yeah. But don't get me wrong, you know, I mean, something like uh, Blade Runner 2049 yeah. is the, the, it's incredible. You know, that is beyond the realms of reality, but I absolutely love the cinematography in it. And I could watch it day after day. I have, so, not, I have not seen that. I've only seen screenshots. What? Cause I, wait, because I, okay, so confession. I'm the kind of person like I can't sit and watch films. I can look at screenshots and cinematography. I love that. Yeah. I can't sit and watch films because Incredible. I have too many. I just I find it very hard to focus on films because I could have edited a podcast in that time. I could have had a <laughs> recorded an episode. I could have edited images. You know, I could have been making music. I do a lot of other things. So yeah, yeah. I, I find it very hard to sit down and watch films. But I look at a lot of cinematography, um, and I actually oh. have a cinematography folder. I'll send it to you if you're interested. Um, sure. it's literally just probably the, the last 10 years worth of, of images that I've saved um, to do with cinematography from a senator I'll send it to you a lot of it's black and white film noirs because film noirs are the best you know that's not right, right. No. so um, yeah I'll send that, that to you actually yeah yeah of course that's really influential on people's work though. that kind of you know, you know some of that I'd, I'd love to be able to kind of see the world in that way and try and yeah. replicate that somehow so a lot of uh, American photographers can get that in, with the yeah. conditions where they live, you know, some of it's great. Do you ever think though that I don't know? If, I don't know how true this is through British photographers, though. But do you feel like the influence of America on Britain is obvious through photography? I think, I, yeah, I think you know, as we said earlier, Britain's a very different place. The conditions yeah. are very different, and to try and replicate. I mean, have you ever seen that? There's an artist years ago called Andrew Wyeth, and of he. Course, yeah. uh, yeah, and he did a picture of a girl sitting in the in the yeah. field. And that image has stuck with me. It's a real romantic image for me, and I, I, I and I'm a, a little bit obsessed with kind of Texas, Arizona, you know, yes. a, yes, a cafe and a Chevrolet outside, 
And this, when I was younger, I used to go to uh, Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery all the time just to look at one painting. And it's a, uh, it was a, a realist painting by a guy called John Salt, and it's called Red, White Chevy Red Trailer. And it's this American scene, but it was painted in England. And it's kind of this, it's a, it's a broken down car and it's really stuck with me. And that was, he painted that in England, I think. But it's a real American scene. But I would love to do some, you know, get, get in my car and drive across America and find these, you know, places. Do they exist? I mean, it's like yeah. a dreamscape to me. It'd be great to go there and spend a couple of weeks getting into trouble over there. <laughs> but, but isn't that funny, though? Because because you because you say that, and I'm feel exactly the same way. Like Phoenix, Arizona is somewhere I really would love to go. Yeah. Um, for like for sure. Like just you know Utah, Texas, Salt Lake City, just kind yeah. of the desert because we don't have that here. You yeah, know, the vastness of it. So. Yeah, it's, it's it's why it's why I think a lot of us are attracted to seasides because we don't live there. It's, it's mm-hmm. a hot, alien place. It's completely out of our comfort zone. It's not the middle of the city. So, is I think, yeah, that's just really fascinating. I think that's that's really funny that you should say that because I feel exactly the same way. Um, I think- and I th- do you think it's kind of like a, it's, it's almost like a dream that you want to go there and see it all? When you get there, do you think it'll be all it's cracked up to me? No, I don't <laughs> think it will be. But I also think it's interesting because we say like, we look at it with admiration and kind of like glamour, but the people who live there could not care less about it. Like that's the interesting thing. And but what they do with their photographies allow us to, to appreciate that. Exactly. That's a really good well, point. Um, yeah, and yeah. I would like to do that. Give yeah. people that opportunity. That's a good way of looking at it. That's a very good way of looking at it, actually. Right, so in terms of editing, actually, so do you ever show the process of your editing? No, <laughs> it's the straight answer. Um, well, like on a reel or, or something yeah, like that? Just, yeah, just generally. Or like, do you ever kind of just talk about it or show you yeah, the before and after or just kind of like the actual process of your editing? No, I don't actually. And maybe I should because um, sometimes it could take five minutes, sometimes it could take five hours, depends on the image. But... Um, no, I should, um, but I find sometimes within the editing process, you kind of, you get into this kind of routine of doing the same thing yeah. with each, and that that's, that can be um, a mistake. You should, you should look, you, you should really think about what, what you want the viewer to think of your image when you're editing it and give the, the, the place of where it was took. You've got to give that credit, you know. That's true. You, you have to. Um, kind of try and portray a certain place the way you want the viewer to see it. If you get what I mean, yeah. that's a good way of looking at it, actually. But like, so how? So oh, sorry, I don't. I don't think when I'm editing, and, and if, if it's something I'm going to publish or put out there, I don't edit it the way I want it. I edit it the way I want other people to see it. If that's interesting. Me, I want yeah. them to engage with it on a different level. Yeah, I was going to say to you, like, do you have an idea, like, when you sit down with an image and you, you find it, and you're like, this is the one, like, do you have an idea of how you want that image to look before you edit it? Yeah. Well, yes, generally. So if if if, if, I, if we take an image that I, I very rarely like my images myself, but um, because most artists, I would tell yeah. Oh, yeah, I yeah, know, yeah. You know, we would probably throw them in the bin if we could. Um, <laughs> but, Don't do that. <laughs> no, no. Um, but if we, I mean, I took a picture, I mentioned it earlier, the Grand Pier in um, in Western Superman. And I went all that way to take a picture of the pier um, because I wanted this. I didn't want any people in it. So I got up at some unholy hour just as the sun was coming up. I knew the sun was going to be golden. And I, I set my camera up to be slightly muted and kind of hazy. And as I took that picture, I knew then how I was going to edit it and how I was going to publish it at that point. And I was so happy that I was really pleased with the outcome. One of the only ones I have been pleased with, but I really liked it. I've actually it's, printed it for myself. <laughs> that's actually, that's good. And actually, it's, that's it's very rare. That's a great idea, though. I think actually more photographers should print their own work because it's so easy yeah. to get used to looking at it on a screen. You don't actually see what it looks like, you know? Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's a, that's a and, really good point. That's such a really good it's, point. Um, it's so nice to have. I mean, when years ago when you used to go for like a university interview, you'd, you'd take a hardcore portfolio yeah. with you. Yeah. And how many how many photographers now have a, a portfolio of hard copies of their work? 
And not even just that, it's just kind of like the idea that your work is physical. It lives beyond yeah. just the computer screen because everything is on a screen nowadays. You know, mm-hmm. it doesn't mean that it looks good. It means that your screen is, your screen might not have been calibrated properly. You know, people might not have been <laughs> seeing what, you know, the amount yeah. of time and effort you've gone into creating certain colors and looking at different kind of moods and, and settings and people might not even have their screen calibrated. Yeah, you're right. So they're not going to get the experience that you're hoping for them to have. Exactly. You know? so, so, but what you got, yeah, but what you got to try and do is, well, I try and do is have that thought in mind about what I want people to think and feel when they when they see an image. And I think, you know, it's, it's hard, but that's why it doesn't always work out. So how important is it for you for your work to be technically correct? Or are you more an intuitive photographer? Oh, you see, I've got real issues with... <laughs> I'm quite fit. I love balance and I like things. I mean, take that photo that I like myself. If, if there was something sticking in on the right-hand side, a lamppost or something that didn't look right, I wouldn't even bother editing it. I'd probably delete it. Why would you crop it? Yeah, but then you lose the balance of certain things as well. I, the other day I took a picture in a field and there was two leading lines going towards a single tree. And I thought, this is great. But I was slightly on the wonk on the path. So when I got back and looked at it on the computer, there's no way I could make it balanced. No way. Without losing the perspective and what I wanted from it. So that's never seen the light of day. <laughs> yeah, but you could have changed it. Yeah, but there are... Wait, you're using Lightroom, aren't you? Yeah, there are ways of manipulating the image to kind of bring... Yeah, I was going to, I was going to you can change. Yeah, you can change the perspective. That would no, be... No, that's going down for <laughs> shot. That's, that's too manipulative. That's, that's cheating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if, you if you're not skilled enough to, to take the image properly in the first place then you know that's what i'm saying you don't do too much you know what i respect that attitude i actually respect that attitude and i think it's kind of funny because i'm like thank god you don't see my process but it's I'm also you know, a mental illness <laughs> 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 but, <laughs> my is just like, i mean you said it, not me. So, you yeah, know, yeah, yeah. But I, I think that's a, a good way to approach it, though, because it means like, you know, you're not just going out and shooting images willy nilly. Oh, well, let's just shoot some stuff today. So, you're going out and thinking about what you're taking pictures of. It's not just, I mean, it might not necessarily seem like it if it's mundane, but it's like you've thought about what you're taking. And yeah, you may take 500 images, but you know, within 500, you'll get maybe 100, maybe 50, maybe 20 that you'd like that are the images. So, I think that's a really good way to work, actually. It's a very interesting also, way to work. Also, you kind of know when you've got one. You, you, you kind of when you've taken you could be walking around and there's there's always the the money shot there's always one you think yeah 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 that's a good one I'm, I'm hopefully when you get back it still looks as good when you when you upload it but hopefully it's still in focus by the time you get back yeah, yeah you know the settings were right but you know we've all done it haven't we been out oh 100 percent like you think oh this is perfect it's great and you take it back you take it back home look on a computer and it's like yes yeah, not even in focus absolute mess and, and it's not even like you can edit it and save it. No, like that's the worst thing. You're just like you're stuck with a blurry image. Although, one thing I've noticed recently, maybe it's an American thing. So a lot of my American friends are doing it, but a lot of kind of camera blurs, like deliberate camera blurs, and kind of shakiness, and the idea of stuff not being perfect. That's kind of being quite trendy at the minute. But that also links to the links to the perception. You know, humans, you can only focus on one thing at a time. The eye can. So we actually see a lot of the world blurred. So it kind of links to human perception that. Not everything is always kind of in focus anyway. That's very true. I like that's a really good attitude to have, actually. I like that a lot. Yeah. That's I feel like that'd be a great kind of like catalyst for a series of work. Yeah. But it's usually when I'm tired. <laughs> I was gonna say, is it just when you've exhausted yourself, you're just like no kaidos anymore? Yeah, yeah, you get or when your batteries run out, you know, there's only a certain life in the batteries. It depends where you are as well, the location. Yeah. I mean, if the weather goes, you know, you're you got no chance. I mean, you can but, shoot in the rain. It's fine. The camera will be okay. Yeah, I struggle with the rain. But, uh, yeah. I need to. I, I feel like know. I need to learn how to shoot in the rain. I think that'd be great. That would be such a good idea. Yeah. I'm taking it here in England, where it's raining 90 percent of the time. It'd be a yeah. good idea. Sure, learn how to shoot in grey light. I mean, that's all we have here. You know, grey light. There's no shadow. <laughs> but there's something nice about that sometimes. I think. Well, I don't know. I it's think. Like, I think. I think the idea of like a store, like like. I don't know, just kind of this idea of like being everything being very grey, very kind of like austere and very kind of serious. There's something really nice in that, I think, personally. Oh, and yeah, there's, a, yeah. there's a sense of calm in that, weirdly. Yeah, but that happens all the time in this country. <laughs> but you don't have a choice. <laughs> I like variety sometimes in life. That's true. I mean, who cares about variety, right? I mean, 
I mean, I don't know. I think it, it depends on where you go. And as you said, you know, what time of year you go, kind of yeah. just like and your eye for things. I don't know. Yeah. Like, and then you also run out of um, inspiration. You know, the, the, you've kind of been around that place. You know, there's no, nothing more to to grab your attention. But it's usually as you're leaving somewhere and you do one last shot, and that shot's the one that. So you've yeah. wasted the whole morning. You could have just done that one last shot. But that's the beauty of, of photography, though, isn't it? You know, the hours you put in, yeah. the legwork you put in, the, the the missed opportunities. You know, it's um, it's all part of it. You know, it's all part of the process. And also, it's like the actual physical journey of you going from yeah. one place to another. It's, and also, obviously, with your camera, but it's also like the actual journey of you yourself as a person, as well as the journey of you yourself as a photographer, as an yeah. artist. Well, there's a, there's a hashtag, I walk this street. And if you click on that, there's some, like, good documentary photo, but interesting photos of people actually where they've been and the images they've created from that, which is quite interesting. So I would actually really be interested to know where you'd lie on the film versus photography debate, because in terms of, like, is film photography better? Is digital photography better? Well, you know, is film photography... The, the right radio is digital for cheating. I'd just know where your thoughts are on that. Because I, I, uh, my formal training was within film photography yeah. when I was probably 17 and then again when I was like 24, 25. And there is n- nothing on earth like watching your image come through in a dark room. You know, the whole process of dark rooms and, you know, getting the spool out, change, you know, getting your chemicals right, all of that is just magical. It's incredible. But I think the cost of it at the moment, the cost of film oh. processing is incredible. However, the outcomes, I mean, some of the people who use film photography do incredible work with film. Just, you know, there's a there's a, there's a a quality to it that you, you just can't get with, um, with digital photography. Um, big side digital photography allows you to throw away hundreds of images if you want to. Yeah. But it also digital photography allows me to preset filters and get and get a kind of effects that I want before the picture's even taken. So yeah. that's why I like digital photography. I like what it, the choice it offers me with pre-editing as well. And you can kind of create with more ease, you know, like the process of actually creating the work is a lot quicker. You can shoot, you know. If you had like a month off work, if you had like a month spare, you could just shoot, you can create a whole, like quite a few, quite a lot of work in that time, as opposed to film. It would take you a long time to shoot stuff, develop it, get it back, <laughs> make it correct. Yeah, but I, th- I think there's kind of more intrinsic value in, in the film photography. Oh, yeah, I, I understand agree with that. I understand agree with that. I, I, think, I, was... I think more film photographers are happier. <laughs> Do I, I would agree with that. Um, I, I would agree with that up into the cost, until they look at their bills. Yeah, like yeah. That. Um, but, but do you actually... As a profession, I think they're happier, you know? That's an interesting way to look at it, actually. I'm actually going to ask them, you know? I'm like, oh, by the way, I've got a question for you from this really cool yeah. British photographer, Ronnie Ackling. Uh, he wants to know, are you happy? <laughs> <laughs> are you happy shooting film or digital on a scale of one to ten? You know, Because yeah. I know a lot of photographers who do both. Um but they shoot digital because obviously it's a lot more convenient, but they shoot, but they'd really love to shoot more film or at least film is what they'd love to just do primarily. They just can't afford it because it's so expensive. It's like, you don't need a family and kids. You've got a film photography. I mean, <laughs> you know, it's the same cost. You don't, you want to drive around a car? Tough. You've got a film camera. That's you it. Know. And you've got to recoup that money somehow. Oh yeah. You? Unless you're very rich. You know, there is out for that. Sadly, I'm not. I, I don't think anybody... I know it is. And if they were, they're not talent, <laughs> so it's all good. Um, so do you actually think it's easy for the general public to determine what is a film image and what is, what is shot on film and what is shot digitally, particularly on social um, media? Uh, not until they look at the hashtags. Um, I think just on a basic image, I don't think um, if, you're not, if, you, if, you, if you're not a photographer, you wouldn't know the difference really. But what was if, which I know a few folks who do this, not going to say any names, but what was if you have digital images that you tag into film hashtags? That's rude. <laughs> Isn't it, though? I, I'm not saying anything. <laughs> I'm not into that. And it's not so I do. Let's just put that out there as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah right. But, however, <laughs> there is a whole notion of editing digital to look like film. There is actually a YouTube video that came out not that long ago by Mango Street, of all people. And it was like five ways to make your digital photos look like film. And I don't know. I'm very intrigued by that because on one hand, I think that's actually pretty cool. I think that's pretty harmless. 
but at the same time, I also think it's pretty harmful. I'd say I'd say there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I'd say it's actually quite a creative process to try and replicate that, and that's I think that's you know a skill to do that. So and that's something that sh- that you can develop because you, you know you could be employed to create something that looks like film, and you might earn some money from that. And the creative process is valid, but um, I don't think you should be putting hashtags underneath when it isn't um, what it is. That's harsh. Some naughty people about you know. Oh, I think the part. I think the problem with it is that it confuses the kind of general kind of discussion of what is film, what isn't film, why it's important to to notice what is film and what's digital. I kind of feel like how are the general public, who are the people you want to buy your work, going to know what your work is valued at, or kind of like what the value of your work is, if you're saying it's one thing and it's something different. You know, I'm not, and I'm not saying you know, that digital photographers should make any less money than film photographers. I don't necessarily think that either. I feel like it just depends on your reputation. It depends on the value of the work. It depends on what the work says to the person. It depends on a lot of other factors. But I do also think that because it's such a, like a furious debate of like, oh no, film photography is pure photography, digital photography is cheating, that, you know, yeah. people should be a bit kind of like, people should be very transparent in what they're doing, you know? Yeah, I think you're right. And I think you should be upfront about whether you've shot in digital or not. But I think it's about whether the work's credible in itself. Um, you know, and 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 I'd I'd like to know if I was buying a piece of work, whether it was shot in film or digital. Would that would that make a difference in terms of how much you thought it was worth? It might make a difference on how much I appreciate the image. Because I I if I think there's a lot more work that goes into film photography, a lot more cost, a lot more love and attention to, to and to get a good image is harder. Gotcha. So I think kudos to the people who use film, really. But then the problem with that is that that's very subjective. What makes a good image? Absolutely. Well, it is anyway, isn't it? Really? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you know, but um, for, I just think... I think you have to give credit where it's due. Oh, yeah. And I think most film photographers would agree that they need a bit more credit for what they try and achieve. It's only I, wonder, I wonder if there is a way, while we're thinking about more ideas, but I wonder Here if there's, there is a way <laughs> to think about, like, maybe, I don't know, doing something with that in terms of, like, highlighting film photographers and digital photographers in their own right, but, like, in a way where it would help people understand the actual process that goes into it. Because, you know, as a photographer myself, like, I don't really know that much about film photography. I've done it before when I was at university, but I don't really know that much about it. And, you know, the cost, I don't think I should really realise the cost until I asked somebody not that long ago. And I was like, <laughs> Crazy. Actually, like, 30, 40, 50, 60 pounds for a roll of film. I'm like, really? Yeah. Like, yeah. do you, how do What's you pay? The, I'd like to know more about how they digitise the image to show it on. Yeah. I, I need to know more about that process because... You know, yeah, I think yeah, but, yeah they typically would scan it. They would scan the negatives. Yeah. But like, but then it's interesting. So it's interesting because they scan the negatives, but then they will edit the image on top of that. Exactly. So, so, so I'm always a bit like, so then why don't you just shoot it on digital? Because it's going to edit it anyway. <laughs> Save yourself a bit of money. And just then, go digital. I, I mean, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, I'm very curious about that, I must say. Like, And I should probably actually have had more conversations about it with people. Here's, here's, here's a question for you. If, you, if someone was taking your portrait, yeah. Would you like them to take it on film or digital? Oh, film, definitely. Hey, you see? Because it feels more personal. And I think yeah. it's also it's, it's it's more personal and it's also impermanent. You know, the fact that yeah. it exists, if that negative gets destroyed, it will be gone forever. Yeah. Whereas like, if you take a digital image, it's going to be backed up somewhere in the cloud as soon as you put it onto your, your device. You know, and it's easy replicatable. With a film image, it's not going to be. That's where the value lies. Now we're talking about it. Like the idea <laughs> of, of reprodu- like reproduction and the idea of... Uh, just being able to copy stuff so much. And actually, have you ever read, I don't know how much you read, I don't imagine you would, because who does? But I don't imagine you read photography theory. But have you ever read uh, In the Age of Mechanical Reproduction by, yeah. I think it's Walter Benjamin, I might be that wrong. Because I did a photography degree a while right. back. So I, 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 you have more read, than me. I have read photography theory that I actually really enjoy, strangely. So I will send you a copy of it and or a link to it. Um, but it talks about this idea of like digital imagery. It's quite obviously quite old, but it's like digital imagery and the idea of like kind of what is considered analog, what's considered digital, and the way that because images are reproduced, does that give them more value or less value? It's interesting. Because one, one could argue that 
it gives you more value because you can reproduce that image a thousand times to make a thousand pounds of each image. But it also takes away from the actual original of that image because you're you're reproducing it so much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So just because a financial value is higher, it doesn't mean that the original value of the image is higher. Well, it kind of goes back to a bit of um, Andy Warhol and the, the yes. reproduction of the image and devaluing it and you know the content of the image is it valuable in itself and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. actually. That's- Maybe a future panel discussion. I don't know, maybe. Yeah, get that involved, yeah. I'm actually going to put that down a bit. So a question I have for you is, like, how do you stay safe outside with your equipment? Right, around your neck, you know, the photography bag, don't have, you know, all these things hanging off you, you know, because some photographers walk around like they're, I don't know, so, do you know what I mean? Like some kind of, uh, some kind of professional, so they're just walking the streets, you know. I just... <laughs> Just try get your stuff insured. That helps. Oh, I should probably do that actually. Yeah, that might help. Um, I've actually um, really badly haven't thought about that. I was like, oh wait, I'm actually <laughs> thought about that. I'm looking, my camera's literally here. I haven't thought about that. Yeah, get insured. Get yourself some personal insurance as well. Um, That's actually a really good point. Actually, That's a very good point. Yeah. Um, but it's about having your wits about you as well, and and don't wear your headphones. Some people yeah. walk around with music on all the time. There could be anyone around you. You just don't know. You're not. You're not fully aware of things. And I think whenever I listen to music and I start taking photos, my photos go, it affects the way I approach my photography. So I prefer no music sometimes. I don't go around with headphones in because it, 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 it affects what I think and the way I approach things. That's really funny because I was walking around <laughs> some industrial estates yesterday morning where, where, with, with a backpack and headphones and <laughs> while taking my pictures. Which is funny. I should be like, probably shouldn't do that next time. Although to be fair, I was literally in my work car park taking pictures. I think my co-workers probably think I'm strange. Because I was yeah. just like, I was like, it's like, you know, half five in the morning. It looks it looks great, it's empty. Um, <laughs> so but yeah, I'm I'm always kind of curious just because I feel like it's not something that we really talk about as photographers in terms of like how to actually stay safe. Because you know, equipment is expensive. If your camera gets stolen or broken, you're um, gonna have to spend a, a bit to replace it. Yeah, and also you have there's a curious thing about people's behavior around cameras as well. If, if, if you are carrying a camera and pointing it at people, some people, which you're allowed to do, you, you can take pictures of anybody in a public place, you know, as you, as you know, but some people really get umbrage with and get angry. Um, and might. So you've got to be very careful about, you know, who you're taking pictures of, where you are. I mean, I've been shouted at and screamed at and, called all sorts of names. I've been, they've asked to see what image I've taken and asked to delete it and things like that, which I'm more than willing to do. You know, if yeah. they don't like it, if they don't want that image on my camera, I'll take it off my camera or I'll just show them a different frame. <laughs> <laughs> That's a genius idea. I'm going to steal that idea. That's a great idea. Yeah, just like, in the frame. I'm like, I'm like, go back to the last one. There's only 500 more images. I'm sure this yeah. one's your one. Um, but then... Yeah. But, with film photography, though, they'd pull yeah. your spool out and your whole reel's gone. Yeah, yeah. But, like, that's... The, and also, that, that the interesting thing as well for me is that, like, it's so different with phones, though. If you were to pull that phone out, nobody would bat an eyelid. Yeah. Nobody would even care. And also, the idea of surveillance in our society will always been captured all the time. Why does it make a difference? And I, mean, I think... Go on, carry on, sorry. I about to say, I think it's probably because they don't have control of that image. Yeah. I, I've been... Um, I'm very conscious as well. Sometimes I'll go to predominantly Asian communities or predominantly black communities. And if you walk around there with a camera, there's different politics around the reasons why you might have a camera. There's immigration issues and things like that. You know, so you've got to be very conscious about the people around you and the area you're in. And you want to pay respect to those people as well. You've got to, you know, respect their emotional, where they're coming from emotionally with things like that. That's actually a really good point because I think we forget also culturally yeah. taking images are very different as well. Some people don't want their photo taken for, a, for just for cultural yeah. reasons as opposed mm-hmm. to like just because they don't care about it, which is kind of weird how we're in the Western world very uh, obsessed with images of ourselves and taking images mm-hmm. of ourselves and, and kind of the whole kind of like selfie culture. Um, like, do you think that's kind of ruined the experience of photography outside of just kind of like the screen? Yeah, I do. I think, you know... Um... The, the whole selfie thing, anyway. I mean, you, you'll, you'll very rarely find a picture of me on the internet if I can help it. You know, it's something I was going to come on. But yeah, yeah. The, the narcissistic element in me is not strong. I don't want people to be, to know. Really, I, I like the secrecy of, of being behind the camera. 
very much so. And I, that's why I respect people on the other side. You know, if, if, if people don't want their picture taken, I certainly won't take it. That would be rude. And I, I don't particularly like my photo being taken, to be honest. So, so I think that's a, I think it goes to the same for every photographer because I don't like my picture being taken. But if I take it myself, it's fine. <laughs> yeah. but, if somebody, but somebody else takes it, no. But it's also interesting because I kind of feel like that's probably why you take images then. Yeah. So rather than be the person being taken images of, you're the person who takes the images. You're the person who's in control. I think it comes. I think it comes down to a control thing. Yeah. Um, at least for me, it would because I'm. That also, then your images become a personification. They they become yeah. part of you and your you know the, what you're internalizing sometimes maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Because every as as I can't remember who said that. I should really know. But every, somebody said like every portrait is a self portrait or every image is a self portrait because it contains some part yeah. of you. Um, yeah. I'm sure somebody really famous said that. I'm probably wondering yeah, why I can't sounds remember. Pretty, sounds pretty cool, doesn't it? Um, but actually, going actually talking about that, then I guess it kind of goes nice into a question that I have from a. <laughs> I say this in every single interview, so you're probably going to hate me. But a good friend of mine called Ryan Dean House, and um, we were talking ages ago about personality and skill, and it's like, what's more important? Is the personality artist more important, or is the skill of an artist more important? You see, I, th- I think I think skills really important and because i mean i remember looking at let's just take francis bacon's work i love yeah. him as an artist yeah. and i didn't know much about him um but I, I, I think his skill level was great and i really liked the way he interpreted the world the way he portrayed what he saw and there's lots of internal angst going on there was all these and i was reading into all this and then and then i read about his personality and that just added more depth to it because he he was all of those things and um he was quite a, a, you know quite a dark person so i think i think i think you got to go with skill first and then get to know the person i think that just adds depth to the interest around it really that's a, actually a really interesting response because a lot of people will say personality first and then skill which is interesting well you um, see the skill before the person i think but then the interesting thing for me is that like people say that, but there's like, so how do you make sure that people see your personality online? See, I struggle with that. I really struggle with putting anything personal about myself. I'm, I'm on about written things as yeah, well. Of course. Um, so you try, you, what I want people to do is try and read into my images, what type of person I am really. So, you know, it's a bit weird saying, you know, some kind of dystopian, derelict view of Birmingham. <laughs> you know, <it's, laughs> yeah, I don't know what that but... says about me. <laughs> but, but that, but that's where I grew up, and that's what I, that's part of me, and that's that's my experiences, and that that's what I focus on. That's why I enjoy, you know. Only because I'm. It's very curious for me because before I do any interview, or even just. You know, even if I, before I even invite anybody to the fine fruit bowl, is I research them, I look at their work and I try to look about more about them because I'm always right. interested in, particularly with interviews, I always see people's biographies because I want to see if the person can talk about their work very well because then I know they'll be able to talk about their work in an interview well if they can write about it well. And it's curious, like people sit to yourself, like you don't have much about your line. And I actually, <laughs> and, it, and it's actually really funny because I actually Googled, obviously, your name, a photographer, and it came up with like, this Dudley photographer with this one image. <laughs> and I was like, literally just one image with the mention of you. And I was like, is that it? Is that yeah. it? And I it's, and it, it's I, used funny. A, I used to have a Facebook account um, with all sorts of things on it. And I, and I had it for years and I kept the Facebook account, but I deleted every post. Really? And it took, it took me weeks to do it. Why did you do the whole Facebook account? No, 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 no. That, 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 that's the easy option, isn't it? I actually went through every and there's no images of me there's no images of my family or right. anything but like, I, I think like, I think it adds a bit of mystery as well you know you don't I'm really not into being the focus of attention around my work you know but I do also wonder though like I, I really, so first of all, I highly respect that and I would love to wish I could do that for myself but I highly respect that so much because you've set yourself up in a way where it's not about you it's about the work yeah. and that's what you want you keep you keep yourself at arm's length to your work. And I think that's very clever because sometimes it's very easy to become too embroiled within your work and be the work yourself. I think it's very, very easy in this day and age. However, on the flip side of that coin, I do wonder like, how are people going to connect with you and feel like, oh, this is a running acting piece. I want a piece of it. 
without knowing the person behind the work. Because I feel like a lot of the time it's about reputation. A lot of the time it's about you know, people feeling like they know you and they want to buy your work. Yeah, they could also message me and I'll, I'll have a quite a nice conversation with them. There is that point of contact. Um, you know, I don't have to have my, my, my ugly mug on, a, on for people to understand me. But it's super interesting to say that for two reasons. One, because Cursed by Morrow said the same thing. And I, this is exactly what I said to him. And he said the same thing. And I said, I actually wasn't sure if you'd reply when I messaged you. <laughs> and I wasn't sure how approachable you'd be. Because obviously I, I see you posting images and I see your work is awesome. And you've seen me comment on your work saying how cool it yeah, is. Awesome. But I don't know. I find it very hard to discern if somebody who doesn't really have much about themselves you know, like how serious are they taking this? Because it's like, is it just a little project they're doing for fun? Or is it something yeah, they actually really want to do? You know, it's hard yeah, for me to discern that. You're quite good at reaching out, though, you see. That, oh, that's, 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 what, I, that's what I do. <laughs> yeah. No, it's a real strength of yours. And, you know, and, and you keep doing it, really, because there's lots of people hiding behind their images that actually do want to talk about it and, you know, and do want to share their ideas and it's, processes. It, it's really funny for me because... There are two other photographers, Casper Morrow being one of them, and another one being Caffeine Cowboy. Um, and those two photographers are like kind of, in my opinion, they're quite well known in the photography community, and particularly like American photography community, although Marcel Casper Morrow is from Austria. Um, but they're kind of like, their work is quite popular. But they're both quite mysterious. Um, and the only reason I actually got an interview with both of them is because they had an Ask Me Anything on their stories. Oh, and, my, right. and my question to them was, can I interview for my podcast? Because that's the best way for me to communicate with people. Because I thought if I message them outright, they're never going to respond. But if I message them on their own terms, they might respond. And they yeah, both yeah. did, which is cool. You know. But at least at least they put on their story, ask me anything. Yes. I wouldn't even do that. You should do that. Because no, no, well, no. no, actually, no, wait, let me rephrase that. Maybe you should do that. Because, <laughs> because people might want to know about your work. People might want to know more about you. Okay. Do you know what? I'll do it. Try it. Oh, Why, have got try. To lose? Why have you got to lose? I'll, I'll say that you you forced me. <laughs> yeah, do it. <laughs> Perfect. But I, I feel like, well, what do you have to lose? Like, do you, like, are you, like, do you want to engage with the audience? Well, yeah, but on my terms, generally. But I suppose there is a way of doing it through that. But um, I'm, I mean, even through, I find, I find the whole social media, I don't, I really struggle with the narcissism around social media. My work is, is about me, but it's not me, if you get yeah. what I mean. Yeah, of course. It's a very separate thing. And, you know, there's other people who love putting pictures of themselves and their wives and kids up and still take great pictures, but that's just not my bag. Also, I've got, I've got you know, a fa- family and stuff. And yeah. there's, there's research into kind of posting pictures of your children and things that, when the child, there's, there's child protection issues around that. And, oh, yeah, and, when, children, and when children grow up, they uh, they really don't like the fact that they, their formative years have been documented by their parents and their childhood has been taken away from them without their permission. And See, yeah, there's a lot true. of research into this. So I try and keep my personal life way away from social yeah. media. You know? Yeah, I think, I think there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. And I think that's, again, that's highly respectable. But I also feel like, then there may be other avenues like ask me anything or like you know um even if, even if it to do once in a blue moon like an ig live just once in a blue moon <laughs> or even even if we should wait listen hear me out even if it's just your location scouting they don't have to see your face they can just you could just be your location scouting yeah, you know yeah. saying what makes a good image or it could just even be your computer screen with a you know a photo shoot what makes a good image what doesn't make a good image what went wrong what didn't go wrong you know it's just stuff like that where you don't have to be the center focus okay. but you're still also within that people will still get to understand you as a person uh, that these are just my opinions so you know don't it's, food, it's food for thoughts it's food for thought I, I will think about it just because the thing that i see when i look at artists and maybe this is probably me looking at too many artists but like i look at them and look at their their audience and i'm like what are you doing to engage with the audience because everyone's bigger numbers yeah. but how are you like how are you supporting the people that already support you yeah because we're always because we're always looking for the next thousand we're always looking for the next ten thousand but what about the people that are already following you like what are you giving them you know and you know you're not obliged and obligated to give them anything but the idea is that like they're here for a reason they may not 
they might not even remember they've subscribed to you or whatever, but they're here for a reason. So why not mm. give them a little insight into your work? Why not kind of, even if it were just to do something like, um, just message them, ask, just send, send out a message saying, send me your favorite, you know, your favorite image of mine. Just so you have an idea of what images are popular, what images people like, or, you know, here's five different Instagram accounts, which is what I would totally do to submit your work to tomorrow. You know, that kind of thing. Like yeah. something like I'm, that. I'm taking baby steps by doing this really. Oh, well, you know, see, this, this is as far as, you know, this is a giant step for me. Well, I don't think you understand how much I appreciate the fact that you said yes and how much I'm surprised that you said yes. Oh. I was really surprised. I was like, no, he said yes. I was like, oh. And then, and then I, I, every single interview that I ever, that I ever do, if someone says yes, I'm like, hey, well, no, I've actually got to do it. Will he turn up for that? <laughs> That is the question. That's the million dollar question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. You know. Well, I'm, I'm glad you asked. It's been, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting. I like talking about all things creative anyway. So. Okay. So what does it mean to be a successful artist and how do you measure the success of your own work? How do, how do you measure success? I mean, and so I suppose, I mean, what, what, what I really like and what, what adds, adds value to me is when, when someone orders a print off you and you know that some of your work is on a wall somewhere, I don't know, in Wolverhampton or something. I think, um, I think that's really, really nice and really valuable that people are actually willing to invest in your work. I think success can come through that, really. I think success comes through with uh, what pe- people buying your work and people appreciate it as, a, as a something to own. Um, that they have, that they've chosen that out of lots of other things to invest in. And I think success comes through that. Um, and obviously the more of that you do, the more money you make, the more successful, and the more you can invest in your own work. So, um, I mean, if, if we think about likes and things like that, that's always gratifying, but it's, it's not it's not success. I think uh, knowing that people like and buy your work is, is, is really, really intrinsically valuable to me. That's perfect. And uh, what was your younger self think about your life? I did write something down for this. Um, my younger self would probably say my work is uh, mundane and boring. Um, they'd probably my younger me would want more a flamboyance, a little bit more extrovert. Because when I was younger, I was a menace and um, oh, wow. a street urchin, and I was up to no good most of the time. And um, they'd, they'd definitely want more. I don't know, more more expression in my work and more probably more variety. Uh, my a young my younger self would say it's it's pretty pretty dull. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> so, perfectly honest. That's so interesting, but but it's interesting how you've changed in such a way where like that doesn't bother you, no. you know. And then in fact you embrace that, which is nice. So yeah. yeah. And okay, so yeah. the final question for you then would be: Go What are you currently working on, and where can people find more about you and your work? Um. As I said earlier, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit stunted at the moment in, in where to go and what to do, mainly because the weather's grey all the time, which I keep mentioning. Um, I don't know. I think I think as a someone who creates images, I, I go through times where I just I'm just not motivated at, at the moment at all. Um, so that will come back there. I know it's, it's a bit like a writer's block. You just got to be patient with it. Um, <clears throat> visiting places always helps. So I'll be going, I'm definitely going to go back to Port Talbot at some point. Um, as I say, I'll be going on different places, different holidays. But um, I want to go to Dungeness and places like that as well. I want to get even probably bleaker with my work. I don't know. I want to explore more black and white as well. I don't do enough yeah. black and white. And um, I just, I kind of wish I knew more about portraiture because I've had some people who do portraiture so good and it's it's so engaging and how they develop the person within the image. I wish I just knew more about that. So what's next for me? I don't know. I, do you know what? I haven't even got a website set up. So I need a website set up. So a big shout out if anyone wants to do it for me. Just give me a shout. Around. I can always give you a with that. Brilliant. Brilliant. Like you you like you I am yeah. so lazy. It's unbelievable. <laughs> Well, this is the thing. I wanted to be able to help people. So, listen again with the whole reels, with the whole website. Like, if you need a hand, just to reach out. I'm always happy to help. Honestly, no, no, no. It's, it's not a problem at all. Okay. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Honestly, Ronnie, thank you so much for your time. It's been honestly such an honour. You don't. I don't think you understand how cool it's been. Um, you know I really what? appreciate it.
That concludes my conversation with the incredible Ronnie Acklin. Thank you very much for listening. If you have any questions or comments about it, please send me an email at theflyingfruitbowl at gmail.com. Please get in touch via social media sites such as Instagram and Twitter. The Flying Fruit Bowl podcast is available on platforms such as Apple Music, Spotify and YouTube. If you like the show, please consider rating, reviewing, sharing or subscribing on any of those platforms to help spread the word. Also, don't forget to check out theflyingfruitbowl.co.uk for daily art inspiration. And if you're a creative, please get in touch for a chance to be featured or interviewed. We now also have a Patreon page if you'd like to support the platform further. To hear start from £1, and to see more rewards and prices, please head on over to patreon.com forward slash theflyingfruitbowl. Additionally, we now also have a PayPal for one-time donations, and I'll include a link to it in our description of this episode. Thank you very much for listening to this episode today. And until next time, folks, please stay safe.